Pam and I have been making a few trips to Tennessee, it seems like, during the year. The last one, we were looking for a particular uh, development of houses, uh, going over there to look and see if there was any property that might interest us for retirement uh, uh, quite a few years from now. But nonetheless, we were looking there. And so, so I did what a lot of folks do. I grabbed my phone, and I went into Google Maps, and I had actually ma tried to map out the places that we were going to. And it's pretty cool, because you can, you can set the direction, and you can just you know, make a big loop. And so that, it was, I thought, this is good. There was one place where there was no address, but only the development. So let's say the development was, we'll use the name Crest Haven. So I, I, I plugged in, and I put Crest Haven, and I, I thought I put in Crest Haven Development, and so we're going along, going along, going along, and of course, you know, Google is telling us, make the right-hand turn in a quarter of a mile, right-hand turn in 300 feet, left-hand turn, so I'm listening to it, and I said, oh, Pam goes, how far are we? And I looked, I said, oh, we're only a couple miles from it, and so, so we kept going, and then it says, your destination is on the left, and I was like, we're by a freeway, and I looked, at the parking lot, and it was like the Crest Haven Senior Development Center. And I was like, okay, this is the wrong place, clearly. So I went back and looked, and what I did is in my haste, I saw Crest Haven and I hit it. So I followed the right directions to the wrong place. You ever, you ever done that? You ever, you ever follow the, I know a lot of times we just, I know, I know the whole joke about men is we don't follow directions. And just as a side note, I'm still trying to figure out, and I know this is going to be sexist, this is going to be recorded, I'm probably going to get emails, texts, and comments, but why in the world are all the GPSs in female voices? I can't figure it out, you know? Is it because us men get lost more than the women? I mean, I'm trying to figure out how that works, but you know, sometimes I can't, I don't even follow directions. Sometimes I follow, I get to the wrong place because I've followed the directions, but that wasn't where I was supposed to go to. It happens to us in life, doesn't it? We wind up following the wrong directions. We get to a place and we go, wait a minute, how did I get here? And we look back and we think, well, I got here because I followed those directions and those were the wrong directions. Or we follow the wrong leader. We think, oh, this person knows what they're doing. They're going to tell me how to do this. They're going to tell me how I can accomplish this. And all of a sudden, we find out they don't know anything. That happened to me quite a number of years ago when I was uh, actually, before I was ever in ministry, there was a guy, I'm not even going to mention his name, but he was doing a, had, had written a book called How to Build a Real Estate Money Machine. And this guy, this guy was doing, uh, doing these, these loans and wraparound mortgages when you could do it. And I thought, this guy, this guy knows his stuff. Well, he just got out of jail a few years ago. <laughs> he didn't know his stuff. And, uh, but you follow these people and you think, oh, they've got the answers. So I follow them, and all of a sudden, you do what they tell you to do, and you realize you have wound up in the wrong place. And it happens to us over and over and over again. Why do we follow the wrong leader? Why do we follow the wrong directions? Well, part of it, I think, number one, is we are so severely distracted in our society today. We are more distracted than ever. This, I, don't ask me why I got caught up in the, the uh, uh, lethal weapon movie. Now, I'm not recommending them, but they were on, and so I watched both of them back to back. My wife says to me this morning, we were talking, she goes, wait, there was something that was missing from the Lethal Weapon movies. There's one thing that was missing. They were in the 80s. Anybody know what the one thing was that was missing? Huh? Cell phones. You, they literally had to go and get it, leave a message on the phone, you know. Remember when we got beepers and you get a, you, you know, because you'd have to actually go home and people would have to leave a message. It had to be important enough for them to call. And then they'd leave a message and then you would go and you would return the call. And often what was their crisis? What usually happened by the time you got to it? There was no more crisis. It was over. They fixed it. Now at the drop of a hat. And so, so we've got distractions that hit us. And we think we're following directions, but somebody dings us on Facebook, and then it's a text, and then it's an email, and then it's this, and then it's that, and then they can tweet to us, and then they can Instagram us, and they can do all of these different things. And so we get distracted, and the next thing you know, we forgot which direction we were even going in. Because we're distracted. 
We get distracted by that stuff. We get distracted by things that are, that are going on in our lives. So distractions are one of those things. Our problems and our pressures will often do that to us too. They will, they will get us off track so that we forget where we're going. It's like when you walk into a room to get something and you get distracted or something happens and you forget, wait a minute, where, what was I doing? I know some of you are going to think that's just because I'm getting old, but it happened to me when I was much younger. We, because something, something happens, another problem, another crisis, and the next thing you know, we've totally changed directions. And we're not following the path that we were supposed to be on. I think sometimes, too, our own dependencies. We get dependent on people to show us the way. We get dependent, and I see it happening all over the place in different ways in business, on what I like to call now gurus. Everybody's a guru. Everybody's got the answer. Everybody's got a system. They got a funnel. They got a business. They got this. They got that. And they're going to lead us into the promised land. And so often we get so dependent, not that we can't learn from them, but we get so dependent on every word that they say that the next thing you know, we have totally lost our way. There's one more thing. And let's, this is most of it. We just make the decision follow the wrong path. We make the decision to follow the long, wrong leader. We say, nope, I'm not going that way. I want this way. And then we're like shocked oh, when we get to the wrong place. What do we do? Because when it comes to rethinking church, we've really got to rethinking who and what we're following. Because I will tell you, people, leaders, will let you down. Why? Because we're all human. All of us are. We're going to mess up. We're going to go the wrong way. But we can't get dependent and distracted by what others are saying. We've got to follow the right leader. Well, how do you know that you're following the right leader? How do you know that you're actually following Jesus? How do you actually know that you're following God? I'm glad you asked that because the answer is found in Psalm 23. Now, before you rush through it, because this is what I would normally do, I would normally do this. And actually, in funerals, I'll actually slow my... I, I, know, the, I know this thing. So I go, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I did that just like an auctioneer. And that's how fast I can do it. And that's how fast I can run through it. So I literally, at a funeral, have to force myself to read it slowly because I can rush through what God is trying to say to me. And so today, we're going to step back for just a few minutes that we have left. And we're going to see, by comparing ourselves to what David says, are we following the leader? Let's kick it back and slow it down. David writing, David the psalmist, David the, David the one who, who, who was a great musician, pins this and he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Whoa. But, you ever stopped and just paused for a minute on that? He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. David, remember, was a shepherd boy. You were in Sunday school, only a boy named David? You know, we, we had all these little songs to talk about David, the shepherd. Now, remember, when you're reading this, Jesus said, I am the what? The good shepherd. So David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. How can you say that? See, right now, if we're focusing on lack, if we're like, well, no, but I got to have this, and 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 I want to go here, and I got to go there, and God hasn't done this, and blah, 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 blah. He, David could literally say, because I know that he's my shepherd, I'm not going to lack anything. In fact, I don't lack anything at all. I am content because he has got me. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I lack nothing. Now let's go on. I don't like the way the NIV renders this because it says he makes me. You know, well, I got, got the idea of, of forcing. I was late for church today because as I was pulling down Griffin Road, I saw the blue lights in front of me and I noticed the policeman out starting to chase somebody and, they, and he got a hold of the guy and the guy started to punch the police officer. So I rounded up as quickly as I could and went back to see if there was something that I could do. And just at that point, by that time, the other police had gotten there and they had finally gotten the guy, the guy down on the ground. And, and I was like, you know, it, it, was, it was one of those things where I'm, I'm looking at the cop. In fact, I got called just a few minutes ago and he says, he says, can you, can you come in and give us a statement? In fact, they said that before I left. He says, um, I, we need you to give a statement. I said, I got to get to church. He said, can you skip? I said, no. He goes, how come? I said, I'm the pastor. He goes, oh, that's a good reason. <laughs> you know? There, there are things that are, that are happening. As I'm, as I'm, and as, as I'm coming here, I'm, I'm late and I'm stressed out. And then I'm, and then I'm listening to what I'm going to say right here. And to what he says. He makes me, finally the officer had to make the guy lie down to handcuff him, right? It, it almost sounds like he's forcing. It almost sounds like God is saying, no, I'm going to force you to lie down in green pastures. And that's not what he says. He literally says in this that, that, that I'm, I'm going I'm to lead you by this place. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guide you there. It's like he makes me, and, and then he says he leads me beside the quiet waters. So it's interesting what he's talking about here, that he's leading me, leading to the green pastures. The idea, if you look at what David was saying here, was there was a lot of sort of dry land. And so what the shepherd would have to do is he would have to, not, and we think of lush green pastures, and you could probably pick this in your, picture this in your mind, but the idea was there was places of little patches of grass. The shepherd would find out where that was at, where they could go and they could actually eat. He knew where he was going. He would lead the sheep to that place where they could graze and they could rest. And that's why he says, listen, he, he makes me, allows me, lets me lie down in green pastures. Then it says, he leads me beside the quiet waters. Let me, let me spend a second here. It says still waters of the King James. I don't know if you've ever been around tumultuous waters. They're not fun if you've ever been out on them. Not fun. There's nothing better that I like than being by sort of a mountain lake. In fact, how many of you listen to every, sound waves and wave machines and that sort of thing? Anybody listen to that? There's apps on your phone. and I listen to the water. There's something about the water the trickling water that soothes the soul. And the picture is, he's going to lead us to a place where we're grazing, where we can rest. He's going to lead us to a place where we can drink and that we can be calm. So the question is, are you living your life with distraction or calmness? Are you living your life in a harried way? Because if you are, then you may not be following the leader. Because it says what he does is he does all of these things. And then it says this. He refreshes my soul. He restores my soul. He brings me back to a place of centeredness in the midst of of the craziness. We can't always live with peace because we've got, we've got horns, we've got distractions, we've got people that irritate us, we've got our kids, we've got stuff, we've got these things. But he says, if you go to a place where you are, are following him, you can always find your way back to the place that he refreshes you. He doesn't refresh your finances. He doesn't refresh your health. He doesn't refresh your business. 
He doesn't refresh any of that. No, he refreshes the most important part. He literally refreshes and restores the soul. Because if we can have our souls and our, and our spirits refreshed, that means that when the health issues come, when the financial issues come, when we lose the job, when the world falls apart, when somebody lets us down, that we can go to the one person at the place by the brook in the woods that he will say to us, I have got you. I know there's chaos out there, but you are here with me and I am leading you. There is a place of centeredness in the midst of the chaos. Do you know that place? Not that you don't have chaos. We, we all got it going on in our lives. I always love when God does that. that he didn't do that to me, but it's like he puts me right in the middle of chaos. I got to come here and speak on peace, and I'm watching cops chase people down the road and have to go give a statement later. But can I tell you something? He refreshes and restores my soul. Wait a minute. There's more. <laughs> He guides me along the right path for his name's sake or for his glory. In other words, he's going to put me in the... Remember we talked about following the wrong path? You're following the right path but to the wrong place. He's literally going to put you on the right path. The paths that are going to lead you to where you need to go. See, we're often saying, oh my, what is my purpose in life? I've got to know my destination. And in this case, it's like, no, no. This case, we have to watch the shepherd. You know what I think is so interesting? If you read the, the history of what happened with the, with the Jewish people, when you go back and, and you look first at, at how God was leading Israel, he led them first with a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. And when that cloud moved, what did they do? They moved. When the pillar of fire at nighttime moved, they moved. If it stayed stationary, they stayed stationary. Later on, what, were they, what, did, they, what did God lead them? With the Ark of the Covenant. Remember the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant was a thing that the priests went down and they, they went down into, and they stepped into the Jordan River and God parted the waters because they were carrying it. But he told them to keep a safe distance from the Ark. Why? Because they could see when it was turning and when it was moving so that they could continue to follow it no matter what was happening. They were following the lead. And so he says, he's guiding me. He, David said, David said, he's guided Israel. Even when they were going in circles in the wilderness, he was guiding Israel. And he says, this good shepherd guides my path, not for my sake, but for his. Not for me, but for him. Now watch. Here's the, here's the one we think of most. And we quote this at funerals because it says in the King James, yea though, don't you love the yea in the King James? Yea though I walk, through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Here's what it actually says. Even though I walk through the darkest valley. Did you catch that? The darkest valley to the psalmist and to the, especially to the people that, that translated the King James was death. But we know what dark valleys are. You've had them. You've had them. You've had them in your relationship. You've had them when you've lost loved ones. You've had them with your health or with your loved ones who've had poor health. You've had that. You've had those dark valleys when people have left you behind maybe betrayed you. You've had those dark valleys. And here's what he says. And I love, and we really got to focus on this because look at what he says. Even though I walk over the valley, I walk around the valley, I walk under the valley, he takes the valley away from me. No. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, which means there's going to be dark valleys then that we're going to go through. Watch this. I don't need to fear any evil. Why? Because you're with me. You are with me in the darkness. I just had my, my cousin by marriage died at his funeral a week ago Friday. And um, it remind, when we were talking with the family, it reminded me of my, my Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred had a hunting camp out in the Everglades. 
I remember it as a kid. I loved going out there, but it was scary. Uncle Fred, he's driving out in his swamp buggy. All of a sudden, he goes, we're going to camp here. And I'm thinking, as a kid, where, where are we? Like, you know, we're out in the middle of this, like, nowhere. And my dad would say to me, he would say, son, don't, we're good. I know you think we're lost, but he says, Uncle Fred has a map in his head. And everywhere he turns, he knows exactly where he's going. He's like a compass. So when it got dark, I think Uncle Fred knew where we were going. When he made a turn, he knew exactly where we were okay out in the middle of the woods because Uncle Fred was there. He says, listen, doesn't matter how dark it gets. Doesn't matter that I, that I can't see in front of me. That the darkness is, I can't, I can't see my hand. And at that moment, I'm going to feel a hand in mine. Because he's going to walk with me. Oh, I know. It's popular to say, well, if I, if, especially with the prosperity gospel that's out there, you watch some of the TV preachers, that you're, if you're sick or there's something going on with you, there's something wrong with you, you don't have enough faith. God doesn't want you to go through any problems. He doesn't want you to go. We live in a world that is messed up. And so he says, when you go through the dark valley, which is going to happen because it's part of life, it's part of the struggle, it's part of this thing called life, I am going to be with you. And he says, I know that you're, that you're with me. Then he says, even though I walk through the dark valley, I will feel you are with me. Now here it is, your rod and your staff, they come from me. You know, there's so many different views of what the rod and the staff are. There's one one thing where the rod was actually, the rod and staff on one of these was actually part and parcel of the same thing. So the rod was that straight part, and the staff is what we understand to be the shepherd's crook. Now, see, I don't, the only thing I understand is shepherd's crook is for pulling somebody off stage that you needs to stop talking, you know? You know what I'm talking about? So, uh, but, but the rod was actually used, the rod part was used for the shepherds to fend off and, and to protect the sheep. Do you know what the, the crook was for? that if the sheep went the wrong way, that the shepherd would gently take them and pull them back. If they, if they went over somewhere and they had to pull, they would reach down and pull the sheep back out. And what he, he says here is, your rod and your staff, they bring comfort. Because what I don't see this shepherd doing is, you know, we like to do this in the church when somebody gets off track. What? Well, they need to do this and this, and we got to hold them accountable. Blah, 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 and we, we go through all of this judgmental stuff. And what I see, Jesus, I don't see Jesus going to, to us as a sheep. You stupid sheep. Pow! Throws a choker collar on us. Oh, he's like, ah, oh, there goes Bob again. Okay, come on back here. He says, your rod and your staff, they bring me comfort. Watch this one. <laughs> he all of a sudden shifts. He's talking about the shepherd. All of a sudden he goes off of this, what seems like he goes off on a tangent. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And we read that and go, yeah, yeah. I mean, gotta get my enemies. Yeah. When they sit down and eat right in front of them and gorge, you go, ha, 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 ha. That's what it looks like. He said, right, right in, the, in the presence of your enemies, he's going to prepare a banquet so that you can eat with safety and security. And then he says this. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Do you remember the story of Jesus? He was at, at the supper, one of the many times he was reclining at the table, and a woman came in with oil. And she literally poured it on his head and his feet. And leave it to Judas, the accountant, to say, at that point, Judas, the guy who was not just the accountant, but the guy that was helping money, taking money for himself. Judas says, that could have been used to feed the poor. And the other disciples chimed in. They all did. Because they knew they weren't going to get some of that. Because they, they, 
they're like, we, we could have used this as an offering. Jesus said, listen, let her do this. She's, you didn't wash my feet. She hasn't stopped crying and, and anointing me. Because you know what the anointing oil was for? It was a gift of honor. You, you know what he says here? <laughs> He's going to prepare the table, let you eat, and then he says, you literally will honor me right in front of my enemies. I'm not going to honor myself. He, he's going to do this. And he says, he says listen, and, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to overflow. He says, literally, you look at it like this, I am going to bless you right in the midst of your enemies. It's going to be, you're going to be safe and the blessings are going to overflow in your life. And then he says this, watch this, surely goodness and love, it says will follow me. You know what the better Hebrew word there, the better way to translate that? Are you ready? Surely your goodness and your love will pursue me. It's not like, oh, what kind of follow me, honey? Yeah. No, it's chasing you. He says, your love and your goodness is going to chase me all the days of my life. He's going to chase you with love and goodness. That if you get off track, it's not going to be, hey, get, get over here. You're, you're grounded. He's going to chase you and me with goodness and love. All the days of your life. And then he said, and guess ultimately what's going to happen? And David says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. That was a New Living Translation. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch, listen at this, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through death valley, I'm not afraid. When you walk at my side, your trusty shepherd's crooks makes me feel secure. You serve me a six course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. The Lord is my shepherd. There's nothing I lack. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord for as long as I live. It means something different now, doesn't it? We've heard it all of our lives. But here's the question. Do you sense that there are moments when you have that? Or is it something that you're going, no, I, I need that? 
if there are, you've sensed that there's moments that you've had it, you're thinking, I, I, want, I want more of that. I don't want to live in the chaos. I want, to, I want to live in the meadow. I want to live by the quiet waters. I want to be able to go there at that moment when I need to. I love the way the message put that. Catch my breath. You ever say that? I just, I just got to. I just got to breathe. If you, if you want that, the question is, what do we do? It, it, it basically, what I get from all of this is that you and I have got to figure out a way, if we want to follow the right leader, to plug into his presence. It's, it's almost like tuning in on the GPS and going, okay, God, where are we going? You type it in. You tell me the, the destination. You know where I'm at right now. Let's go. But see, here's the problem. I get distracted. I get dismayed. I've got, I make wrong decisions. All of these things happen. But I, I notice, have you ever noticed on your GPS that if you've got the radio on or you're talking to somebody on the phone and you're running it through Bluetooth, that no matter what happens, it'll be behind you going, turn right. It's like it'll interrupt the conversation to tell you where to turn. It's, it's always got the, the primary voice. It's always the thing that's telling you where to go. And so whether you're in the middle of a conversation, whether you are listening to an audio book, whether you are, 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 are driving and just trying to be silent, suddenly the silence will be pierced with Google telling you, turn right, turn left, do this. It's always being tuned in, knowing that he is always there and being ever present listening to his voice. Because here's what he says. Just imagine being able to live life knowing that he is there as your provider. Because that's what he said. Uh, there's, you're not gonna have any wants. You lie down in green pastures. You, there's restoration, there's guidance. There's protection in the middle of the dark valleys because, because his presence is there. And protection from the enemies. And there's that, that presence and there's that blessing. And then he says, listen, I'm gonna pursue you. So if you get off track and you go off the wrong path, listen, I'm coming after you not to take you down and handcuff you and drag you away, but I'm going to come after you and I'm going to pull you back on the right path because you are mine. That's incredible. So what, what do we do with this? Just keep listening to him. You say, you mean like listening for his voice voice? Be careful with that. He's already talked to us in his word. But I believe that sometimes he'll prompt us. If you know enough of the scriptures that I ever notice how it hits you at a particular moment, it's like, man, oh man, oh man. That was, I'm not going to say it's God talking to me, but man, he, the spirit of God must have been prompting me to do something right now. You've got to listen. You've got to learn. But then you've got to let him do his thing. The biggest problem is we don't let him in. We don't let him work because we want our own way and we want to do our own thing. We just have to follow him. It is so e simple, but it's not easy. Years ago, we were on our way to uh, Georgia. Our ex-neighbors used to, um, you, they used to live next to us, our next door neighbors, Richard and Janet. Janet, they, they moved up to a little town in Georgia and they, Janet has since passed away. But the first time we went by there, Richard said, I said, so give me your address. So he gave me the address and he says, Bob, listen, um, don't, he says, don't put it in the GPS because he says, you're going to get all messed up coming up here. And I said, no, no, GPS works. He says, trust me, I'll tell you what I'll do. He says, you call me when you get to this particular store and I'll come down and meet you. Okay. So we met, there was Richard. I followed, I followed. I followed, and he was right. The GPS was going, you know, going in circles, reroute, 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 reroute. And I kept following Richard. Even when the mist, when the GPS was wrong, I kept following him, followed him, followed him, and we pulled into his house. And I thought, that's it. That, that's what this following Jesus thing is. Sometimes he says, listen, you need to, I'm going to meet you. And you've got to stay close enough where you see where I'm turning. Just follow me. Don't get distracted by all the other noise. Don't get distracted by your problems and pressures. Don't get distracted by the darkness. 
Don't get distracted by all the other stuff that's going on because here's what's going to happen. You keep following me and I will guide you safely home. Let's pray.